Now, this is the, the Miner's Memorial at Valiant Lake. And uh, what, what it does is commemorate the death of all those workers who died as a result of exposure to radiation underground. They, worked, uh, they were not informed that mining and radium was dangerous. They were never told that they would get cancer and silicosis and die. The information came out in 1976, so nearly 25 years after they, you know, they were working, um, without ventilation. Um, so it, it really troubled me to see that the corporation was, you know, signed on to cost plus contracts without any risk, and they were too damn cheap and greedy to put proper ventilation systems in the mines to protect the workers. So there's 239 names engraved with more to come. And um, it's a testament that uranium mining kills, essentially. It's a fact of life. This is my nephew, Jacob. We were on tour up in Elliott Lake last summer. And he's pointing to my father's name. That's my father's name, Henry Grew. And he worked at Denison. And he died at the age of 63 from mine-related illness. And it was a, sort of to add insult to injury. It's not just that uranium mine kills, but if you file the workman's uh, a compensation claim, you're denied immediately. You are just automatically denied. And you'll receive a letter from the board saying, this death was not caused you know, by your father's exposure to radiation in the mind. So, uh, Kevin talked earlier about the biological effects of ionizing radiation, and what the problem is there's a disconnect with provincial standards and the international community in terms of safe level of exposure. And Ontario is really in the dark ages with respect to uh, workers' health and safety. So I appeal to the board citing um, the international report. And I challenged the board to review their standards. So have you heard the, uh, the statement that nobody's ever died from a nuclear accident that a nuclear plant in the United States? Yeah. How do you react to that? It troubles me. I just think I'm offended. I'm deeply offended when people say that nuclear energy is clean and safe. If you have a look at my territory, there's nothing clean about it. We can't eat the fish there. And to your knowledge, um, this uranium was, was, was mined for um, two uses, weaponry and the production of electricity? That's right. That's right. So that, yeah, the contracts were there, and we know, I mean, we know who they were with. I mean, they were with the UN. <coughs> you know, one of the reasons that, that um, I was particularly interested in you attending today is because uh, I have often made the statements that we only tend to look at the bright side of, of this particular industry, um, although we know it comes with extreme liabilities because it is supposedly, quote, and I put it in quotes, so regulated, okay? And, you know, the plant itself, and I think all of us in, in this room has been down to the plant, and we, we are we are met with this security going through it and the armed guards that, that patrol uh, throughout it. So there are extreme liabilities to this. And one of the reasons I wanted you here uh, is that people don't know the externalities of the liabilities that, that occur uh, from this industry. And we need to know that what we uh, are reaping, in my mind, supposedly cheap energy is it at is your cheap. expense. It's only $35,000 for a dead miner. That's pretty cheap. You know, I, I'm i offended. I'm really offended by it. And I think cheap energy, too cheap to meter, at what cost? Who pays that cost? You know, and frankly, we're not prepared to pay that cost anymore. Frankly, sourcing is going to be a heck of a problem. If I have anything to say about it, I mean, I am committed to keep keeping uranium mining out of my territory. Never again. 
The sacrifice, I and mean, it's not, because it's not an answer to global warming, it is water consumptive. We just gave up 10 lakes. We're not counting the fact that that area is surrounded by a refinery, it's the chemical uranium refinery, which processes the fuel and makes uh, uranium, what was it, hexafluoride? And so it's dumping into, it's dumping into Lake Huron. It has a license to uh, emit radioactive uh, material and nitric acid out its stack every single day. It's licensed by the Atomic Energy Control Board. The technology for mining uranium is the same today as it was in 1955. Dumping into uranium. That's the best we can do. Were they, were they working unionized? They were unionized. They were organized by the uh, USWA. Bio-leaching. Bio is that um, something that's happening in the world? Well, there's talk right now um, because because of the price went up again. As, um, exploration companies have been coming back and they've been talking about bio-leaching, but what it is is basically injecting sulfuric acid into groundwater systems to leach out the ore and then pump the slurry out. Um, so we find that equally distasteful, and their argument is that it doesn't create the kind of waste um, that hard rock mining will create. So this is, uh, for your information, there's a moratorium on uranium mining in British Columbia right now. Okay. Well, there was, um, it, in the area, the indigenous people practiced sort of a mixed economy. So it was some subsistence living, hunting, fishing, trapping, you know, guiding hunters, etc., cetera, uh, with a little bit of lumbering and maybe some work on the rails. And that's the way, that was the way of life. The sulfuric acid plant, like the government, uh, the federal government, through the Department of Indian Affairs came and put that sulfuric acid plant right in the mid, in the heart of the Indian village. Because they needed access to the water from the Huron plant. And also because it was central to providing sulfuric acid to three different mine sites. You know, so it, it was strategically located. I doubt very much that it actually had anything to do with providing employment opportunities to indigenous people. Because they built a village, they actually built a village and segregated lands on the reserve for uh, the personnel, you know, the trained personnel from the South, from Naranda uh, to come and live on the reserve so they could be close to their plants. So they did import workers who were non-Aboriginal and put them on the reserve to work at the plant. It was just sort of not, you know, but it wasn't sort of a, a generous thing of the Canadian government to try to give jobs to. Well, I 